You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And I'm Jared Mounts, Jake's Bait and Tackle. So we got a pretty cool guest. I'm so pumped to get a movie star actually in the studio here. Yeah, John Odenkirk. So we're actually related, uh, cousins by marriage. Uh, John's been uh, employed by the Virginia Department. They've had a name change, Wildlife Resources, uh, for over 30 years. He doesn't look that old. Um, I don't feel that old. <laughs> and he's been doing it for quite some time. Uh, very, very knowledgeable. Um, he he actually, too, I was thinking earlier, when we first opened, we'll be 10 years old, bait and tackle shop uh, this fall. And he was one of our first kind of guest speakers. We did up at the high school, Jameswood High School. Mm-hmm. And he came in and talked about snakeheads, and uh, and so he is a snakehead specialist too. Uh, awesome. Anything and everything about snakeheads, which we'll get into today, uh, but we're very pleased to have him here at Jake's. Uh, kind of talk about a lot of different things, the fisheries that he is in charge of managing uh, here in Virginia, including Lake Anna, the Rappahannock, and and uh, Potomac, and so and snakeheads, and we'll get into anything and everything. So, uh, John, if you want to just tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Jared. I appreciate it. Nice to meet you, Thomas. Really um, amazing new place here. I haven't been to the new shop, and if y'all need some fishing equipment, you're anywhere in Northern Virginia. Come by Jake's, man. This place is stacked. It's like Green Top used to be back in the day on Route 1. Anyway, hey, hey, my name's John Odenkirk, and I work for Virginia Department of Gaming and the Fisheries. Now we're Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. And um, yeah, this has been a great ride. I just love what I'm doing. I love working in Northern Virginia on these resources. And I'm, what I try to do is share what I've learned with our constituents, our anglers out there, and, and I'm happy to do that every opportunity. Um, so I've got about 12 counties in my work area. I go as far south as Lake Anna, and I go as far west as Skyline Drive. So I've really got a great job. I, one day I'll be working with brook trout up in Shenandoah, and the next day I'll be on the Tidal River, maybe you know chasing uh, largemouth or, or snakeheads or something like that. So we've got a real good diversity of resources, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to talk about it with you. That's awesome. Um, you want to just dive right into Snakehead? I mean, that was something yeah. that they've been on the scene for quite some time. And I can remember talking to you early on. It was kind of like a lot of people were freaking out initially because mm-hmm. it was unknown and which rightly so. But I can remember you early, early on too, uh, like say over 10 years ago, just saying, let's just kind of wait and see um, what happens here. Like it's kind of like one of those things we don't know yet. And so uh, maybe start back to when we, we first yeah. came on the scene and like, just what when do you did see it, now? When did it become a problem? Yeah. They start making those bad sci-fi movies about the, yeah. these things crawling out of the Potomac River going to kill Because you've people. been on it since the beginning, right? Yeah. How much time you all have? <laughs> I could, I could <laughs> talk, I probably could talk for days about Snakehead, Snakehead. And, and the way this whole thing kind of fell in my lap in 2004. Um, yeah, it, it was crazy. I mean, before 2004, all we'd heard of, anybody had ever heard about snakeheads were the two little pond incidents in Maryland and stormwater ponds. And both of those populations were eradicated hmm. uh, with toxicants. And, 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 you know, we had plenty of reports, both from the tidal Potomac and other systems of people catching snakeheads and it always turned out not to be snakehead. It was usually a bowfin or a, an eel or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in May of 2004, I got a phone call from a guy pre-fishing a bass tournament and um, he caught his fish in Little Hunting Creek, which is a Virginia tributary. So it sort of made it relative, uh, relevant to me. And I, I tried to play it off. He actually, I, I remember him pleading with me on a Friday afternoon to drive up 95 and look at his fish. And I really didn't want to do that. If you've been on 95, you know why. <laughs> but um, I, I, he, he, was, he, he was from South Florida. And he, he said, mm. I've seen bullseyes. You know, that's the, the genius, the species they have down there. And I said, I said, all right, I said, come, come look at it. And, and I went and it damn sure was. Mm. He, he had the first northern snakehead from the open tidal Potomac system. Mm. And it was caught in a Virginia tributary. So that created a whole chain of events. It was, it, it was really chaotic and crazy for a time because really nobody had any information. You know, mm. all we had were the, the news reports, the media sort of were driving this train of, of frenzied um, sensationalism mm. and, and it made a great story, you know? And, and so it was on all the local and national news. It was, it was on, like you mentioned, the movies, uh, a lot of B movies of fish terrorizing people and eating them, ripping them in half. And, <laughs> and, 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 was, but, and we had people calling the office. They were genuinely terrified. They, they didn't want to go near the water. You're they kidding. didn't want their dogs to swim. No, mm-hmm. I'm not kidding. As we found out about populations at a golf course in Mount Vernon because the, the, the manager of the golf course refused to let his dog swim. He was terrified that his dog was going to get eaten by the snakeheads 
Um, I'm, I'm absolutely very serious about it. So, <laughs> and so I, the first thing I did was I started to do some research um, mm. because there wasn't anything really written. There, there, there was a, there was a, a document put together by Walt Courtney, who was with the USGS, and it was a, a sort of a species risk profile with all the different species of snakeheads, of which there were easily over two dozen. And out of all those, the northern, which is the one we have, mm. Argus, was the uh, the one that could tolerate our winters, or the winters in most of North America. Gotcha. And so that was the one of concern. And there were several pages devoted to that, and most of the references were obscure references, what we call gray literature. They weren't published, or they were from uh, different countries, and they weren't even translated into English. Um, and, and so I, st I started calling people old school, um, uh, some internet work back then, but remember this was like 20 years ago. Um, and most notably, I spoke with an individual scientist in Japan hmm. where they had Northern snakeheads were introduced and um, they had been there for about a century, kind of like large mouth and small mouth. A lot of the fish that we think of sort of as native, but gotcha. really aren't native. Gotcha. Um, so, so snakeheads in Japan were sort of their naturalized long-term beneficial fish and then somebody had recently introduced largemouth into lake biwa where they had this awesome snakehead fishery and and the, the fear was that the, the bass were going to destroy the snakehead Interesting. and i'm thinking wait a minute wow. this is, the this reverse is of what right we're it's okay. turned on its head no one knows about this it sounds like a detective noir story first off you get in contact with the guy in japan like that's i want to know that story and second like how did did they just decide that you have to head the snakehead task force is it because it was in your jurisdiction like this is like an insane thing <laughs> it was insane it was <laughs> <laughs> um those are great questions though you're taking me memory lane um so yeah basically it was, it was i was sort of the lead biologist because it was in my district okay um and i was communicating directly with gary martell who at that time was the fish chief and um you know, with some input and, and almost immediately after that happened, Maryland DNR and the Fish and Wildlife Service got involved because the Maryland, typically Maryland owns the Potomac River right up to our shoreline. So even though the, the tributary we found the snakes was in Virginia, uh, undoubtedly at this point, and then over the next few months, over we did manage to collect 20 snakeheads that first year, 2004, gotcha. all combined, all agencies doing surveys, which is primarily electrofishing and angler reports, which I think was about half and half angler reports and, and agency collections. Um, so we got, and, and then, and then honestly, I was, I'm trying to remember how I got the, um, the guy's name in, in Japan. Um, I'll have to, I'll, th I'll work on that, try to get back to you. But I also talked to a woman in Hawaii named Annette uh, huh. Tagawa. She was, she was a biologist that had been there for a long time, luckily, because she knew a lot of the history of, of snakeheads on, on, um, Oahu. I believe it was Oahu. And we also talked to Gary Shafflin, who at the time was the director of the South Florida Water Management District dealing with the bullseyes in South Florida. But the thing, the neat thing about talking with these these three people, these three biologists, uh, South Florida, Hawaii, and Japan, was that, and, and all these had long term, relatively long term snakehead populations, self sustaining. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so I said, okay, so what's the damage? What's what's the problem? And and, and at the same every turn, I was met with, you know, we don't understand your question. Like basically, what, what are you saying? What what do you mean? What's the problem? I said, well, they're supposed to be really bad, right? They're supposed to eat everything and. and you know, annihilate the ecosystem. That's, that's what we've been told. Hmm. And they, they were all said, well, no, the, the problem is there aren't enough of them. People like them and they're wow. not here anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was verified again, when we had the international snake head symposium a couple of years ago in Alexandria. And I had that gentleman hmm. uh, from Japan. Well, it wasn't, it was his, it was his uh, coworker. It wasn't, it was his mm -hmm. peer. It wasn't the exact guy I talked to, but it was somebody that managed Lake Biwa for years. He came and gave a presentation in Alexandria. I had Annette come from Hawaii and gave a presentation in Alexandria. And I had a person from South Florida, Gary's retired, but I had another person come up. And, and it was the same story wow. to this, you know, so this was fast forward like almost 15 years later. And it was the same story that, um, and, I, and there were a lot of people there from up and down the mid-Atlantic, federal and state agencies. And I hope that this would sort of calm the fears a little bit. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there's nothing to fear because we don't want these fish to disperse and get in waters, perhaps where there's an endangered sure. fish or something like that. But for in waters where they are now, we have yet to see any negative impact. Mm -hmm. And then the knock I usually get is, well, you're not studying everything. And that's true. We're not studying everything. So I can't tell you with 100% certainty that there's nothing in the ecosystem being damaged by the presence of normal snakeheads in the Potomac tidal system or the Rappahannock tidal system or any number of lakes where they are now in my work area because people have stocked them everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, which we're doing outdoor evaluations at kind of laboratory settings in Burke Lake and Lake Brittle, which are two lakes that we own. Mm -hmm. But the reason I say at this point, I'm not overly concerned about their impact 
is two, two things. Number one is you look at the record, the, the upper level of abundance. Where did the abundance level top out? And what is that in relation to other predators in a similar niche mm -hmm. in their system? So when you look at the ultimate abundance in the areas where they've been the longest, so I call those my core creeks around Mount Vernon. That's where they were discovered in 2004. And if we go through time, the abundances in all those creeks peaked at almost the same year. And it was about mm -hmm. nine to 10 years post-discovery. Mm -hmm. After that time, the abundances began to decline Interesting. significantly. Interesting. Uh, and so now we're at lower levels of abundances in all those creeks where they were initially found. Hmm. And then when you look at in context of that predator, in addition to another predator, such as largemouth bass, we see typically um, another, an order of magnitude level higher of, of abundance. In mm -hmm. other words, if we go out now in, in the tidal Rappahannock or the tidal Potomac, and we do a survey for electrification survey for bass or for snakeheads, we usually try to quantify the abundance in terms of a metric in fish per hour. So we sort of standardize it in that mm -hmm. way. So we say, how many fish did you catch per hour of electrofishing in the system? We usually break it up into runs or so forth so we get some variability estimate around a mean. But the, the bottom line is typically we're usually close to 100 bass an hour in a lot of these systems. There's a lot of bass out there. That's a really good catch right. rate. It's a high catch rate. It's a healthy catch rate. And, and these systems are productive and capable of supporting that catch rate. When we look at the catch rate of northern snakeheads, now in the coarse creeks where they've been the longest, typically we're in the single digits. We're in like the three, four, five, six snakeheads per hour. So mm. you see, when you compare that to the, the bass proportionally. abundance proportionally, yeah. yep. and, and then you think, okay, well, these systems are phenomenally productive mm -hmm. and the number of bass is going to vary considerably year to year anyway, based mm -hmm. on what we call variable recruitment. That mm -hmm. is the, the year class strength of spawning. Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and then you throw in, you know, five or six snakeheads an hour. To that, I mean, and that's going to vary by 10, 20, 30 percent mm -hmm. year to year. It's, it, what does that mean in, in right. terms of what it's, it's a wash? Exactly. You know, it, it, there's, there's there's nothing at a population level effect that's even relevant. Um, so it, as long as it's always they stay this course, right? If nothing right. changes based on what we've discovered so far, it certainly looks like um, the early prognostications were, 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 were drastically off. I always felt like too is like a dog eat dog world. So like you know the bad when they're fry when they're young the bass are probably gonna and I, which I don't know if you've done studies where you can know if the bass are eating them or not. And the other question would be in Japan did they find when they introduced largemouth was it did it affect the snakehead or, or no? So yeah, um, we we do know that the plenty of snakes are getting eaten by largemouth All bass. Right. There's no cool. well, when snakeheads are young they they they, they have guards. You know, typically mm. the, the, the parent, both the male and the female, will guard juvenile snakeheads for a considerable length of time, mm. which theoretically gives them a competitive advantage because, mm. you know, typically a large mouse is not going to guard its, its progeny nearly as long. Okay. So there's a, there's a host of things like that mm. that would, on paper, seem to give the northern snakehead a very uh, big advantage right. over native or naturalized competitors. But if you take those guards away, mm -hmm. either by uh, a bird or by an arrow mm -hmm. or by a, a frog, right. swim a, a frog with hooks in it, um, then those those fry, whether they're fry or fingerlings, they're going to be extremely vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, as they flutter around at the surface, learning to air breathe, mm -hmm. and they have like a orangish, yellowish, almost luminescent tail and, and, and rear posterior portion. Um, they they just stick out like I mean, it's unbelievably get picked off by by everything out there. Um, and gotcha, so we've right. seen that, you know, people say, oh, there's no natural predators. You know, we, we've seen all kinds of birds uh, hammering these things. Hmm. Um, so there's a, there's a lot, a lot of additional predators besides humans mm -hmm. that are working on these new populations. And, and I think that in conjunction, that exploitation in conjunction with the ecosystem coming into context, mm -hmm. you know, they're being assimilated into their new habitat, mm -hmm. the ospreys, you know, the herons are figuring out, you know, where to hunt for them. Mm -hmm. and, and so that everything comes... It's, it's, a it's a progression. It's a progression. with If you look at it in, in the introduction, um, there's a theory of biological invasiveness. And, and typically, everything's going to spike after a certain period of time. And then it usually comes back into some context mm -hmm. with this, this novel ecosystem. Interesting. Based on the new data that you guys <clears throat> have, have gathered, can, can you say where the initial intel on the snakeheads came from? Like, as soon as the snakeheads got on the spot, it sounds like a lot of people were misinformed about everything about them like where where did that initially start those rumors or that intel come from oh uh, so there's a good paper published by tom orrell um i think it was in 05 or 06 shortly after snakeheads were determined to be self-sustaining in the potomac and of course the first thought was well maryland didn't get them all either crofton or wheaton 
Um, they, some of them got out and that's where the population came from. But they had genetic samples of those populations and we had genetic samples of all 20 of the 2004 fish. Mm -hmm. And so Thomas uh, analyzed those and came to the conclusion, I think rightfully so, that those were, there were discrete populations. In other words, what, the, the, the population we now have in the tidal Potomac was not related to either the right. Maryland ponds. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a separate introduction, hmm. likely from a very few individuals. I, looking at some of the genetic sequencing, I think he was able to determine there was not a great degree of, of variation or, or um, there's a term for it that's escaping me now, but um, divergence maybe. That, that, that What he meant was that that population was from very few individuals. So somebody probably released a handful of fish um, why we'll never know unless somebody makes a deathbed confession, but it could have been due to a prayer release, which has been documented. It could have been due to somebody buying some for medicinal purposes or just to eat and then decided they didn't want them and didn't want to kill them. Or it could have been deliberately to create a population. I mean, and I'd heard the restaurant there, like as far as like, they're yeah. so, they are, we'll talk about this a little later, but they're so good eating fish. Like mm -hmm. it's, well, a, they're amazing. Uh, yeah. They're, and it's like, they're excellent. Know, so the restaurant's kind of like, oh man, we're going to start, you know, selling these. It's in just interesting that we got it. It not they no one got it so wrong but the idea like even what you said at first like oh how bad is it going to destroy the ecosystem like where did that intel come from at, at first where everyone thought this was just going to just destroy the potomac but then when you ask japan and florida it's like oh, it's not going to be that bad like is that the media spin because it's such a great villain is that where it really came from a lot of it was media spin that there was one ill-fated press conference where somebody i believe it was a person with the u.s fish and wildlife service held up a comic book strip uh, uh yeah. and, and based based it based the um <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, i'll leave it at that yeah <laughs> but let's say too i mean it, you got to think too that we're not used to like the the, the teeth I and mean, we've had we have mm. toothy species in in our virginia waters but then the, the whole living on land i mean that so the biology of this fish like it's it's mm. can you kind of speak to that too like it's different than anything we've it's very we've unique ever seen it's unique so right and, and a lot of those unique traits are what as I mentioned before, what puts it in a sort of special category mm -hmm. that makes people more fearful of it right. than they might normally be. And of course, we all heard that it could walk, which it can't. Right. Okay, we're going to take that one off the table right away. <laughs> it, it does breathe air, though. And, and, and for me, I even had a little bit of a wake-up call because I thought probably up until about 2009 that it was a, a facultative air breather, like a bowfin, you okay. know, our native bowfin. When, when water uh, oxygen perhaps gets too low, you know, that fish can have some rudimentary lung um, ability to to um, supplement mm -hmm. what it's getting from the water through air breathing. Uh, the snakehead is an obligate air breather, which is really wow. bizarre to me. Even still to this day, somebody that's worked with fish and, and then um, which means that if you if you deny the snakehead the ability to gulp air, it's going to drown. Uh, or die, you know, just it, it will suffocate from lack of oxygen, mm -hmm. which which is bizarre. But then when you see it swim bladder, if you've ever cleaned one, you'll note that the swim bladder is extraordinarily large. It's like the size of a Cuban cigar, and it runs from right behind the throat all the way to what we call the caudal peduncle, which is that flat area right before the caudal or tail fin. And and it it's it's a massive swim bladder for any fish. I've never seen anything quite like it. And, and I guess that's why when they during the winter months, I used to call it a hibernation. Um, Nick LaPont, the PhD student I worked with for a while from Virginia Tech, the guy that worked on snakeheads for, for a long time. He, he and I go back and forth. He calls it a torpor, you know, not a true hibernation. Um, so, you know, we can mince words with that. But essentially, they shut down for mm -hmm. a great deal of time in, in, the, in the coldest part of winter, mm -hmm. usually um, mid-January to, to maybe late February, early mm -hmm. March. They're going to be buried in the mud and inactive. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the reason we don't see them gulping then, I think, is because they're just their metabolism so low they don't have any real, you know, uh, output in terms of metabolic activity, and, and they can subside, subside on, um, subsist on the, the residual air within mm -hmm. that swim bladder. Um, and so, and then you mentioned the teeth. I, I think that swim bladder is also used for a function in feeding. They create almost a vortex uh, when, when they feed. We've had one in uh, captivity for a number of years in our office and watched it feed on numerous occasions. In fact, I think there's some video of it floating around out there on YouTube where they'll, they'll almost put their nose on their prey and, and then all of a sudden you'll see and hear sort of this this, rub, this bubbly vortex swoosh and, whoosh, and and then the food's gone and then all you see are scales coming out of its, its gill flaps and and it inhales the prey whole okay so we mentioned the teeth don't lip one because the teeth are, it's actually not really visible when you look at the mouth right. you can kind of see them it's not like a walleye or you know a pike or something right. where you can really see those teeth protruding but they're there right. like bowfin have teeth i wouldn't want to lip a bowfin either um but 
they never use their teeth. That's the bizarre thing to me. I, I've, we've, we've opened up hundreds, maybe thousands of snakeheads to determine what they're eating and other things. And I've never, ever seen one perforated prey item. Hmm. The items are all whole, really? inhaled whole. And what it's, are they eating? What is their forage? So in the tidal river systems, like the Rappahannock and the Potomac, typically the number one prey is banded killifish. And that's just simply because that is, that's a little native minnow. It's called a fungulus. It's a little fungulae. It's, it's a top minnow. It's a, if you flounder fish, you use bull minnows frequently. It's a brackish water fish, does really well. They're tolerant on the hook and flounder like them. Um, but it, there's a lot of different kinds of killifish, but banded killifish is the one we find in, in typically these freshwater tidal systems in heavily vegetated areas where you find snakeheads. And it's not that they're selecting these fish, it's just that they're extreme opportunists mm -hmm. and they're gonna mm -hmm. eat whatever's in front of their mop yap when they're hungry. Mm -hmm. And typically that's a banded killifish because of where they live. And so you could have a six, seven, eight pound northern snakehead and you're finding banded killifish in their stomach that are smaller than your pinky finger. You, know, you might find six, eight, 10, 14 of them. They're mm -hmm. just sucking them up like little popcorn, you know, pop, pop. And, but that's what they're doing. Now, mm -hmm. if, if they get a little bit deeper, you know, and they come across a bluegill, that's going to be the, the second favorite food item by number. If you look at it by weight, which is probably a mm. more accurate way to look at the contribution of an organism, it, mm. bluegill will be the number one food item, both in tidal rivers and in lakes. Interesting. Um, just be simply because of where they live. Mm. And, and it's not just bluegill, but it's any of those round shaped sunfish species of that Lepomis genus, mm. um, like pumpkin seeds, like mm. red breast or red ear, uh, all those are going to be uh, preferred food items because of where the snakes live. I was gonna, that, that was my next question. Is that just because of where the bluegill and the snake had actually yes, coincide in the same exactly. habitat compared to like the white mm -hmm. perch or, or the gorilla right. perch, things of that element? Like at Lake Anna, occasionally we'll, we'll start with, you know, people illegally stocked them in Lake Anna and we've been tracking that population for about six or seven years. And we see them down there now. And, and there's there's not a lot of hydrilla in Lake Anna because the grass carp and the, the landowners don't like it, even though we like to have a little bit of it for habitat. Um, but, but there's a lot of water willow, which is an emergent plant. And right now at Anna, um, that's where most of the snakes are simply because, well, number one, we were coming out of winter and the, you know, the, the hydrilla and other SAV was in senesce for the winter. So it wouldn't have been available anyway. But now, um, even though it's starting to grow, they're still in the, the water willow a lot because that's the, that's the habitat that's there. And, and you see a lot of white perch on the outer edge of the water willow. So we did see some white perch in snakehead stomachs uh, this year at Lake mm -hmm. Anna, just simply mm -hmm. because of that interaction, as you noted, mm -hmm. w w whatever, you know, habitat, it's going to bring that prey close to the predator mm -hmm. and it's just right there lurking waiting for something to swim by and we talk about that so much on this show that yeah if you like the one thing we've talked about a lot is the f1 program but it's like mm -hmm. it's not just about making sure you have good genes for your bucks mm -hmm. but do they have the corn do they have good mm -hmm. feed do they have good habitat yeah. like you know and so how much do we ever talk about the bluegill population ever in this stuff do we talk about the crayfish it's so important like these right. little keys that no one talks about it's always the big name stuff of like do we have the florida strain or do we have the brook trout but is everything else in that chain actually set up for success I mean, it's probably not a good measure but for us like just looking even the potomac to your point like the bass population has been very good like so in size and just numbers and it's it's been a good fishery quality mm -hmm. fishery so that tells me that they they are coexisting and there, there is plenty of forage, forage, not knowing, you know, and how it is, but just by you know? looking at their, their girth and just, mm -hmm. you know, pure size, it seems like they're eating good. When it's good, it's good. And, and I, I presented a paper in um, Charleston, South Carolina in February at the Southern Division American Fishery Society meeting. And in that paper, I detailed the population trends of these predators occupying essentially the same niche in these two river systems, mm. the Potomac and the Rappahannock. And the, the neat thing about um, and, and this, this little discussion we'll have here can kind of bring us into this, this variable recruitment theory, which I've already mentioned once, okay. which is extremely, I mean, I can't overemphasize to anglers. This is like the one, the one sort of theory or the one, um, the prevailing truth, you know, in, in, in tracking your favorite fish, whether it's a smallmouth or a largemouth or a snakehead, especially in a riverine system where you have this high, highly variable recruitment. And, and what it is, is, is it's, it typically comes down to successful spawns are related to environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, these environmental conditions are related to flow. How much, how much water is coming down the river mm -hmm. in the spring. And in the case of these tidal systems, it, it, it's, it's multifaceted because if you, you don't want too much water, 
you don't want too little one, mm -hmm. right? It's a Goldilocks principle because typically what we had, and, and so what, what we got set up for beautifully with the snakehead introduction and the Rappahannock, which wouldn't occur until 10 years later after it was, they were introduced into the Potomac, was that right around 2000, the Rappahannock tidal bass fishery crashed. And we had, I mean, you talk about pissed off people. We had people coming to our, our board meetings of our agency board in Richmond demanding that our agency stock the Rappahannock River because the fishing had gone to hell. And they were right. The fishing had gone to hell. Uh, we didn't know why at the time. Uh, Bob Greenley, who since retired, and, and, and me and a few other biologists set about to try to figure out what was going on. Well, we hadn't spent, historically, as an agency, as a fisheries division, we hadn't spent a ton of time on tidal rivers. We worked a lot on non-tidal rivers, like the James and the mm -hmm. Rappahannock, that smallmouth fisheries there. And we worked a lot on reservoirs. So we were starting to figure out a lot of those secrets. But tidal rivers, rivers for a, a large part, were, were, had been neglected to some extent. We didn't mm -hmm. know a whole lot about the population dynamics of, mm -hmm. of fish species in those systems. Um, in my case, a lot of it was, was simply because I didn't need to worry about it too much because it wasn't my river, right? Um, the, the Rappahannock was doing its own thing and there were, and there were problems up until then. And the Potomac was Maryland's river, you know? So, you know, I'm good. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm on Burke Lake or Lake Anna or Lake Orange or wherever, or up in the mountains chasing trout. And, and then so th when these really, really angry people started showing up and making phone calls and writing politicians, and then we had to, we had, we had to write letters for the director to, so that he could send a state senator or a delegate, um, you know, that's when people start taking notice. And we got to say, hey, you know, what's happened to this fishery? When we went back and started looking at some of the, the climate data and the flow data, and if you remember around 1998, we, we had some tremendous mm -hmm. droughts, mm -hmm. tremendous droughts. And then it got worse, 99. It went into 2000. What we did, we lost all our aquatic vegetation in the tidal Rappahannock to salt intrusion. Salt basically killed mm, all the SAV. That's right. um, and then we had some floods after that. We had mm. some tremendous, we had some tropical storms. So we, we, had, we had a five years and consecutive years, either due to floods or droughts, we had four complete failures of largemouth oh, bass spawn. Yes. Okay. You talk, you take four. Now, now Mother Nature's, you could deal with one, one or failure two, or even two failures. Notice, yeah. But if you put four failures in a five year mm. block, and then you fast forward that block about three to five years down the road. Correct. There's a huge hole in that mm -hmm. fishery where there should be some fish. Mm -hmm. and, you, and and we're thinking, everybody, and I, remember you told me that a while back, and it's it makes so much sense. And at that time, though, you're looking, what just happened? Like, right. just you're looking in the right. last year or two, you know. But, like, to his point, you got to go back to that, that recruitment class. You right. got to go back in time to decide, determine why is it so poor now. And that's why it's valuable to have a, an index of some sort of Correct. recruitment, whether it's what we call a yoy index, a young a year index, or a juvenile index. Uh, they've done it with striped bass in the bay mm -hmm. forever. They use sains and they have you know average mm -hmm. sane hall, number mm -hmm. of baby stripers in a sane hall. But those things are tremendously valuable to be able to forecast. And you're and seeing those trends now. That's what you said. Mm -hmm. You've right. got enough data now. The state right. has enough data mm -hmm. on record that you can go back and look and see and kind of determine, kind of like now what you'll do mm -hmm is if you start seeing it, if we saw it this year, next year, and the next three or four years, like you're saying, now you're going to predict, you know, in year four or five, you know, 2020, whatever it's going to be, right. you know, it's going to be poor. And ideally, and, and like in a perfect <clears throat> world, you could see that coming and you could try mm -hmm. to mitigate it. Gotcha. You know, for, for a brief tangent, we, we were going to try to do that with, with smallmouth and, mm -hmm. and the Rappahannock and the Shenandoah and the James. Like if we knew we had three or four blowouts in a row, well, as soon as that, as soon as we, hit, we got through June, and, and, and the water, you know, was off the charts. We could say, okay, we know we're going to have another bad one. Let's go ahead and stock fish this fall. Um, we tried to do that. We just couldn't get enough fish. Mm -hmm. But that, that's an example of how, number one, just having that information so we can set angler expectations. So, we, hey, guys, you're going to have a bad year for a year or two. And just, mm -hmm. just be prepared for it. And so that, at least maybe they're not screaming as loud. Mm -hmm. And then also mitigating it by stocking if we can. Mm -hmm. But going back to the Rappahannock. So here we are now. We're, we're, we started collecting data there in 2003 because of because of the this mm -hmm. bass crash um we did stock some fish but that was way way downstream from from where my, my study area was with you know I, I basically go from Fredericksburg down to port royal there's about 20 miles of river there and so we collected we had we had almost 10 years of pre bass data before snakeheads showed up on the scene so snakeheads show up on the scene we're also collecting bowfin, by the way, too, because hmm. bowfin is a species of interest. So all along, we've been collecting bowfin. We don't collect everything. We don't do full community surveys. We simply can't. Uh, we'd have to have a chase boat and three more biologists, and it would take um, wow. it would take forever to work the fish up, and we'd probably end up losing a bunch of fish. It's just it's just not possible logistically to do community surveys on most of these scenarios, even though we'd like to. So basically, we're picking up species of prime interest, which in our case on the Rappahannock is largemouth, smallmouth, bowfin, and um, and snakeheads. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were able to track those populations over time for 20 years. And 
what we saw was was snakehead showed up and they kind of they, they kind of percolated for a little bit they didn't jet right up like they did in the potomac the first couple of years they, they they boiled they simmered they call it simmering a little bit and then they shot up but when they shot up there was something interesting happened it, i've worked that stretch of river now for over 30 years and i even though there's tons of hydrilla above fredericksburg there was never any grass in the main stem rappahannock between you know, Fredericksburg, which is the, the head of the tide, and, and Port Royal, which is the lower end of my work area. There was, if you got in some of the creeks, you could find some, but the, I could never understand. Now, it's a less productive system. I, I don't think there's quite as many nutrients being pumped in that system. And the water's a little, maybe a little bit more tannic stain. Uh, so maybe the light transmission is not as great, but it's really hard to understand why there was mm -hmm. no grass in that system for so long. Now, it could have been you know, these are catastrophic events, floods, uh, hurricanes, droughts, um, maybe push you know suppressing it over time mm -hmm. but what for whatever reason about three or four years ago we started seeing a lot of hydrilla in the main stem right around the hop yard that's that's a, that's a secret spot don't tell anybody but if you want to put in a boat right a hop yard go straight across the river a little bit upstream and you're going to be in some sweet sweet area for, for snakes and uh bass but but right about the time we started seeing all that grass in the main stem um, you know, we were trying to quantify it, so I can't tell you how much grass, but I can tell you in, in 30 years, it's the first grass I ever saw, and, and the creeks were loaded as well. Well, not only did you see snakehead numbers go up, but bass numbers go went up, and bowfin numbers went up significantly. We've got all three of those species, the, the linear regression curves on the abundance of those three species at the same time were significant and incredible. Uh, and so, and it, but, but in context, again, we're not looking... We're not, the additive model isn't really there. So we're talking in the Rappahannock, maybe our average catch rate on at fish per hour is about 70 bass. And then you throw in maybe not even 10 snakeheads and then maybe a dozen bowfin. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're still at around a hundred fish an hour of this, of this predatory niche, which I think is, is reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, but my point is, it's, it's not, nobody's benefiting apparently at the expense of one another. Right, right. When it's good, it's good for everybody. Right. Okay, if we, if we have some bad years for recruitment, which would likely be related to reduction in grass, then everybody will probably take a hit. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, times are good, and everybody seems to be benefiting from the enhanced mm -hmm. habitat. Hmm. Very interesting. So, I don't. You want to talk about the stocking first or the grass first? Because there's two two questions I have there. Either way, Which way go, you ahead. go for it. Okay. Um, well, let's start with the grass first, because I find this awesome, just fascinating. What are the factors that go into aquatic vegetation flourishing? Because it's the same thing that happens on the Potomac River. Yeah. It dies, and we don't know why. Is it that we just we don't have enough money going towards a program like that to learn it? Is it because there's a mystery thing that we don't know, like so we can better understand it in the future and help maintain it? Because if I knew I could help with with hydrilla or native grasses growing, I would definitely donate to help with that. It just said, it seems like there's some kind of mysticism of we don't know why, or I could be wrong. No, you're you're pretty much on it again. Um, so yeah, there's a couple things there. I want to concentrate first on on the why, and then also, and then I want to concentrate on on hydrilla versus native SAV. Um, so first is the why. I don't, I had that same question you did, and I kind of still do. Um, there's a very smart woman named Nancy Rubicki, worked with the USGS. She's a botanist. Um, she was one of the ones we've been working on. It's a water chestnut thing, mm -hmm. sort of a complete tangent, but. Um, Chaconis was talking about that. Yeah. Yeah, he brought that up in that yeah, podcast. Nancy and Virginia Carter, who published a bunch of papers with Nancy. You can go just Google her name and, and you'll find a bunch of, of her work out there on um as freshwater sav and tidal systems a ton of good work and she has a number of theories about why you know this year there was tons of grass in this creek and next year there's no grass in that creek and and, and do i mean where i've been working for years now with bass and snakeheads little hunting and dog are two of our study creeks are great examples dog used to be full of milfoil i mean full of it. it was probably one of the best milfoil creeks on the virginia side anywhere in that area and there's been no milfoil there and there's been almost no sav in there and probably for seven or eight years now it's just devoid of vegetation. Hmm. There's still bass in there, not as many as there used to be. And there's still snakeheads in there, probably not as many as there used to be. Um, same with Little Hunting Creek, which is the next drainage to the north near Mount Vernon. Um, used to be chock full of hydrilla. Now you can you barely find a scrap. Um, then you go one drainage south, you go to Pohit Creek, Gunston Cove, and you can walk across the SAV there. It's a true salad. It's got you know native stuff, you know, hydrilla, everything. Uh, it's just a beautiful wonderland. The water's gin clear on top of that. I mean, uh, Kauai Creeks. I mean, most of the creeks, mm -hmm. Quantico Creek still has a ton of milfoil, but mm -hmm. milfoil, you know, Chaconis might have mentioned a lot about the architecture. Certain people like different architectures. Well, for whatever reason, snakeheads love hydrilla in terms of the architecture for its habitat and mm -hmm. how it builds its nest mm -hmm. and all that. Um, maybe because they evolved together. I don't know. But um, the, the Nancy's, Nancy's one of her main 
her postulated theories related to what she called propagule transport and then and then the sediment suitability for receiving those propagules, which is essentially the seed, the seed bank, how that gets moved around, and then where those seeds end up. Are there adequate nutrients to support growth of the plant? Uh, and in the sun, and then transparency, sunlight. Is, is there enough adequate sunlight getting to nurture those plants in early growth before they can start kind of filtering and cleaning the water and then creating that that cycle where the more grass, the cleaner the water, the better grass, the more grass, you know, everything's so good. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy both ways, so to speak. Right. The, the worse it gets, the the less likely grass will be able to, okay. Exactly, exactly. It gets harder and harder for that, for the grass to, to get colonized. And, and I'm, I'm becoming more and more convinced every time I go in Little Hunting Creek and I see the number of common carp in Little Hunting Creek and how they, we'll go up in Little Hunting and it wouldn't happen in rain for two weeks. And the water will just be, it looked like a, like the worst coffee you've ever seen. And I'm like, how can this damn water be this dirty? You know, you go to, you go to Pohick and it's gin clear. And, 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 and some of that's because of the grass, but, but you know, it's not for runoff. And, and then you start, you, you hit the juice on a shocker. And instead of bass and snake heads rolling out of the lily pads or the, the spatter dock, it, it's, it's, you know, they're all 10 to 15 pound carp and it's not one, it's how many hundreds are there. Mm. Uh, and so to me, you know, the evil poster, invasive poster child in this story is not the snakehead. <laughs> it may not even be the blue catfish. I think it's the common carp. Um, the, you know, they're just, they're so problematic on so many levels. It, it, uh, and, and it just completely, at this point, they've been around so long, you know, nobody's even really talking about them. But, but to me, that's, that's a big problem. But anyway, so getting back to the SAV. So when you have that turbidity, you're never going to get anything because nothing, nothing can grow, right? It needs sunlight to grow. Um, so when you combine the nutrients, the productivity, and of course, not only is it based on common carp, but it's also based on a lot of weather, weather patterns. Right. So if you have a cold, wet spring, you're not going to have as good SAV beds later mm -hmm. in the summer and fall, probably. Gotcha. And then you're going to have less nursery areas for recruitment. Mm -hmm. So you'll probably have reduced recruitment. Whether or not the spawn was as good in the spring, you're still going to have reduced recruitment because of uh, lack of the nursery areas Interesting. and, and the, the fort or the, the refuge. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes down to functionality of, you know, of course we'd like to see coontail, we like to see valisoneering, we like to see the native SAV in our creeks, but um, it's, it's, it's not even, I don't think it's even disputed anymore that Nancy was one of the ones that, that put forth this theory that the reason we even now have as much native grass as we do have is because hydrilla created the conditions to make it suitable for that grass to come back. Right, I see you're happy about that. I'm happy about that too, because we we be we we that that said that's I mean, in addition to the Clean Water Act, that was probably the single having hydrilla accidentally introduced mm -hmm. to the freshwater tidal Potomac River was probably one of the greatest things to happen to that resource. Um, I mean, I could tell you a story. Like that. I had friends growing up. I remember <clears throat> we go to Lake Anna all the time, and they would just dump chemicals off their boat dock because they called it like weeds and stuff. And this was like a long, I was like eight and they would do this and dump chemicals because they thought grass was this, it was, it was not, uh, it wasn't a vegetation. It was a weed. It was pond scum. It was nasty. And then you grow up and do all this and you realize like, this is such a key element that you don't want to become not to knock Florida, but like their whole issue with, with managing stuff because they're over pesticide. Like aquatic vegetation is so important, but to the native person, you know, this from like holiday, it's just, it's, it's yucky. Get it out there. Firebomb it all. And it's like, but the hydrilla has probably done a lot for the Potomac over the years when it was really bad back in the day. And I don't know. It's just, it's an interesting. It's so important for the ecosystem and as yeah. a whole. And I think the problem, like he's saying, and I know we have different users, but the ecosystem, everything that it does to provide oxygen, to take up the phosphorus, to provide cover mm -hmm. to for the phytoplankton and the, the whole food source all, all the way up the food chain. And, and unless you look at the entire ecosystem as a whole, mm -hmm. same thing with snake, it, it all applies. And I talked to one of the uh, professors in Florida when we were dealing with Lake Holiday, you know, talk to me about this, this hydrilla and okay. Yeah. It's not native, but what is native? Like you're talking about smallmouth. It's not native either, but it's still, right. and, and his point was it's natural. It is mm -hmm. natural and it's going to do a job. It's going to filter. It's going to, it's going to do the job. Now invasive where, or it, it takes over, you know, yeah, I could see that, but the advantage we have here, we're mountainous and we've got a lot of depth in a lot of our bodies of water. So when you're talking about light, grass is only going to grow in a yeah. certain percentage mm -hmm. anyway so it's not like it's going to choke it out like in florida or where your, where your constant depth is 10 foot or eight foot you know and so you could you could choke out a water system here not likely mm -hmm. in most and, of our waterways and, here. and because i want you to get back to your story to me it's not as much about people debating whether it's native or invasive it's getting to the same page that we all agree that we sh that we need it right and it seems like unless you're a hunter or an outdoorsman you don't look at vegetation the same way as everybody right. else like right. you said like anna 
it's a pest. It's yeah. a nuisance. They want a swimming pool, basically. Yeah. Certain and, people, I say they. Mm-hmm. Certain yeah, people that's like true. And I think pool. that's just an interesting like dynamic I see from outdoors people versus the person that Correct. just goes to a lake for a week. And um, I think the education of that too, that which is good. That's yeah. why I like doing this stuff too. Educating, you know, with with the correct information, and then and then fi- how do you find that balance? Mm-hmm. And also knowing in ecosystems, that what I'm hearing too is is uh, a cycle of population, whatever it is, any mm-hmm. living cycle is going to cycle. It may peak, it may get very high, and then it's, it might die off, and it just tends to cycle out mm-hmm. depending on the year and the conditions. Right. Yeah, well, and Vim, VIMS recognized that. Virginia Institute of Marine Science, which is sort of the consulting body for VMRC, our sister agency. Mm. VMRC is more of a permitting agency, and they don't have a lot of biologists and scientists on staff, so a lot of times they'll they'll farm stuff out to mm. VIMS. And there was a project that came forth um, at Dyke Marsh, South Alexandria there, and uh, one of Steve Chaconis' favorite fishing holes. He knows a lot about this story. And um, the National Park Service wanted to recreate Dyke Marsh. You know, they, they have they had a, they had an aerial photograph of a hundred years mm-hmm. ago mm-hmm. what Dyke Marsh used to look like, and they said, well, you know, because we because of erosion and because of this this and this, now it's gone and we want it back, and so we're going to put it back, and we're like, wait a minute, how, how's that work? How how can you go back and recreate a footprint from a century ago when everything's changed in the watershed at all? Mm-hmm. And and this, basically there was full speed ahead, damn the torpedoes, and we said, well, no no, what? and and so they had proposed filling acres and acres of of submerged aquatic vegetative beds with 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 sand in order to create a, an island essentially and we said no um, no that, that doesn't really seem <laughs> environmentally sound mm-hmm. and, and and for a long time you know our agency was the only one really making noise about that and then vims you know came to a meeting and and one of their top scientists came out and he said we don't care if it's hydrilla because that was what the national parks were saying well it's hydrilla nobody cares about hydrilla and we said, yeah, a lot of people care about hydrilla. And, and one of them senior scientists came out and he said, we deem this as a one-to-one replacement ratio as if it were native grass. Really? Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And wow. that, was, that was a huge, that, that's even when I was surprised, I said, wow, these hydrillas really, people really understand the functional benefits there you go. Uh, that this habitat is providing wow. for fish and shellfish. Good um, information, very good information. Because yeah, you know, that information is not out. I'm telling no you, one, No out. one knows like, that. No. It's everyone still thinks yeah. it's like you know we got to kill it. It's not supposed to be here. Like, at least the people I talk to in my well, circle is pretty, pretty small. It's interesting. <clears throat> Snakehead and hydrilla were, yeah. were in the same category in, you know, but yeah. But the carp, it's like, but no you one talks to about professionals. That. It's, well, and but there are there are still differences of opinion depending on on oh, yeah. what water yes. body you're managing. I, mm-hmm. There are still biologists in our agency that that hate hydrilla, and their first thought is to try to eradicate it in any system that where it shows up. Um, I, I've got it in, in a lot of my waters and I, it's very difficult to control hydrilla without eradicating it and to try to keep it at a level that's suitable for most users. Okay. We've already alluded to sort of, you know, the eye of the beholder in terms of how much okay. hydrilla is enough. Mm-hmm. Um, many people would say, you know, a lot of people might say 50% coverage. Some people would say zero coverage. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's, you know, walking the tightrope to try to balance that is right. usually really hard. And, and there's, we, we've tried to come up with, you know, where you stock this many grass carp per vegetated acre, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, every system's different. The productivity's yes. different. The biomass, every, this, everything's yeah. different. So, and to your point, who you talk to? I mean, you talk to 10 people, you might get right. six different, you well, know. Since Lake Anne is your lake, so to speak, in a perfect world, what would your balance be for that? Like like 1% coverage, 10%, zero? <laughs> it was totally up to me. It would yeah. probably be somewhere in a... a Five to ten percent range. Five to ten percent range. I mean, the thing about Anna, though, especially the further you go down, it it gets much clearer. It, it, a, a big reservoir like Anna is a trophic gradient, and so the upper end is where all the productivity in it is, is. It takes almost a year for a molecule of water to get to the dam. By the time that gets down there, it's just stripped of everything. It's like distilled water, which is why your visibility down at the dam is like twenty feet. You know, you can see up. It's like two inches. You know, at five twenty two bridge, um, and so because of that, you know, that's why back in the the early 90s, 91, 92, hydrilla did get out of hand down there. And, and you have, you can't just manage it, a, a multi-use lake like Anna for recre- mm. for fishing recreation. Oh, yeah. right, you've, right, got right. To, you've got to manage it for multi-use, mm-hmm. which includes aesthetics. It includes boating and water skiing mm-hmm. and swimming and all that other stuff. So you've got to take that into context. And, 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 and because of that, at Anna, it was even more difficult because hydrilla could colonize that. We were already talking about how deep could it colonize. Mm-hmm. Well, Anna, you know, it was colonizing in the mid-high teens. Mm, I mean, impressive. so you had... That's that's a lot of hydro. That's a lot of that lake that could conceivably be colonized. Mm-hmm. So, that's why. It's, and, and I think at Anna we've done a good job of trying to tweak with limited herbicide treatments in certain areas, 
and also using limited number of grass carp to try to keep the number. And we've, we've been so far so good um, with minimal complaints now going on six or seven years wow. um, without having to get out of hand again. But it, it is very difficult to try to, in, in that scenario, to, to keep everybody happy. Yeah, your so job's let, gotta be hard. Yeah, all the but, and you're doing a good job because, yeah. and let's, so let's talk about Lake Anna, because, and if you haven't seen it, there was a YouTube video put out, you were on it, and I think it was a state video, basically talking about the management of Lake Anna, kind of what you've done. And I think, I mean, the pictures I'm seeing from some of these Sunday tournaments and just regular oh, yeah, tournaments, 20 plus, 20 to 30, 30 pound bags of, you know, five and, fish. It's it's fishing like it's on fire right now. And so Lake Anna, and I think, you know, you're a big part of that management. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of maybe just talk about the fishery, the health of the fishery and you know, what you, you've done or seen yeah, or I, where we're at on Lake Anna. It's phenomenal. And I would love to take all the credit for it, but I mean, I'm just watching it happen. Um, you know, we took that a silly slot limit off at 12 to 15 inch slot years ago, but that was useless anyway, because nobody keeps fish. So it right. doesn't do anything. So, yeah, I mean, all I've done is, is, is watch it flourish. And, and to me, and, and it was incredible. You referenced the bags. I mean, we've been going out now. Well, I've been surveying it. I've, I've been using a standardized survey at Anna for over 20 years, uh, spring electric fish in three days, different parts of the lake. And it, it's pretty much gone nowhere but up in terms of numbers and size since we started that standardized survey, but it wasn't as significant as it was until the last few years. And, and remarkably enough, about three or four or five years ago, you know, one spring we, we were like, you know, wow, this is, this was definitely the best this lake's ever looked, you know, to, and you take it back and you crunch the numbers like, yep, this lake is definitely the best it's ever looked, both in numbers and size. And they come back the next year. It's like, wow, it happened again. And the next year, wow, it happened again. And so like this year it wasn't, we didn't quite break last year's record, but mm. it was damn close. Actually we broke it for one, I think we broke it for fingerlings. Um, but for most categories, most sizes, different sizes of fish we, we, we use for our metrics, it was, it was not quite as good as, as 2021, but still, I mean, we're riding the, the peak of this wave right now. And the amazing thing is, is the F1s aren't even show, they haven't shown up yet. Mm -hmm. Really? And so what we're, what we're looking at is an increase oh in big fish wow. and an increase in numbers of fish. And we're just now getting ready for a third year F1s. That's so crazy. we've got two year classes in there now. And those fish aren't even, they, you know, they're not even close to being those big fish at the weigh-ins. Wow. That's how, freaking how incredible. How big were the F1s when you stock them? The F1s when we stock them, size your pinky finger. Wow. Two to three How many did you put in? Well, it's a variable rate. Um, there was a, a guy that named Dan Getz who used to work with our agency. We went across the river, damn him, to Maryland DNR. Um, but he worked with Scott Smith, who was his boss, one of my buddies. And they came up with a pretty cool study design where we've implemented a variable stocking rate based on that lake's historic fingerling production. Okay. So be recognizing that every reservoir is different. So the, res the, the big lakes involved in the study, like Smith Mountain, um, Lake Anna, uh chickahominy i think mm -hmm. there's like five or six of them around the state we put, try to pick one major one in every every region and and so we look, went back and historically looked at the number of fingerlings in annual surveys and then miles of shoreline and they came up with something based hmm. on the literature in terms of how many fish to stock that's interesting and it, but it, it's, it's i think it's a six-year stocking study and in each lake it's two years of a me high a medium and a low rate gotcha and 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 that way we can not only try to because it's not, it's not cheap <laughs> buying these fish, which sure. we, we do have to buy these. We don't rear them ourselves because these are F1s, meaning uh, I don't prefer the term tiger bass, but it, it's a hybrid. It's, it's a pure, it's a first generation. That's the critical. It's okay. a first generation cross between a pure northern and a pure Florida. Okay. That, that, are, that are raised at a hatchery specifically designed to create this cross. Wow. And they're marketed as F1 or, or Tiger Bass. And for the people at home that don't know, is, is there a specific reason why uh, Virginia can't raise them? Is it a licensing thing? Is it like is, we don't have the right facility? Is there any, what What are the reasons? Most the Mostly we just don't have the, the pond space and the okay. facilities right now. Um, the pond space is extremely limited. We're doing the best we can with stripers and walleye and, and all the, the sunfish species. And, and you know, uh, most, most fish we do that we stock in Virginia and with trout especially we've got cold water and warm water hatcheries most fish stocked in virginia are raised in our state hatcheries that your licensed dollars help pay for the big exceptions are channel mm -hmm. catfish which we bid those out to the private sector because we, we stock a larger catfish and we just can't produce them as cheaply as the private sector can so we'll, and, that, and most of those don't reproduce self-sustain in small lakes even like mm -hmm. burke lake or lakes like that Definitely. size they don't self-sustain so we stock those annually and then uh f1 largemouth we, we don't do those ourselves um simply and, and now hybrid stripers are something we used to do those in-house but we, we're outsourcing those because we can bid them out cheaper than we can build them our, uh, mm -hmm. grow them ourselves 
So, but to get back to the, the F ones, so so those get, are stocked at two different rates, uh, three or three different rates twice each to give us some statistical power. And when we start analyzing, crunching the numbers sure. and seeing if 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 it because because we're trying to find out two things really, are adding these fish helping increase abundance, mm. which that isn't a huge component of it, but we still want to know. And if, if they are increased is, or if they're not, is, are they taking the place of wild fish? Is it the compensatory additive if there's a number increase? And then the main thing I think all of us are more interested in is, is can we increase the top end? Right. And, and the, the, the conventional wisdom on F1s is you only get the bang for the buck out of the original cross. Okay, it doesn't that. extend to what we call FXs. Although there's some, I just had a discussion at a reservoir committee meeting at that Charleston uh, AFS conference I mentioned, and some of the biologists from other states, especially like further south, Louisiana, Texas, they believe that there is still some benefit of an FX. Well, for instance, FX is FX is just any any blend of northern and Florida that's past its first second generation, generation right? Second, Beyond. third, fourth, fifth, however many, mm -hmm. um, and bred with. We, they're just mutts mm -hmm. essentially, right? Gotcha. And so, but the interesting thing is when you look at the genetics. So we've done all of our major water resources over the years, we've just done just baseline genetic surveys to try to figure out what percentage of Florida alleles are present in these populations. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the presence of Florida alleles, typically the further south you go in Virginia, the higher the presence is, and the lakes more renowned for large bass, such as Briar Creek, um, the higher the percentage of Florida alleles are, and to some extent. Um, so that would indicate that perhaps FX is, maybe there is something there. Okay. that helps a little bit which is intuitive right you'd think um as long as it's not too high because i think what happens is if you get too high and we get more uh seasonal winter effect you know those fish don't do as well mm -hmm. in colder conditions right you don't expect florida bass to do real well that's why we don't stop right. here florida bass in virginia because right, it's not right. texas it's not florida it's not southern california um so so th so the, the gist of this thing is it's going to take a while for us to sort it out mm -hmm. but i, I think and Smith Mountain already got on. They were on early mm -hmm. because they had they had outside private money, dirty. private mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. That that it's that, that's what happened with the chick with the, the chick was what was our back when the Rappahannock crashed and CBAV conserved bass anglers of Virginia came to us and they said we want you to stock fish now and we said well it's really expensive to stock fish now especially since back then that was before we had genetics like right now if, if we want to know if it's one of our stocked F1 fish all we have to do is take a fin clip send it to Auburn that's all. Uh, and pay them like that's 18 all. bucks per fish and they'll tell us with, with I mean, hundred percent certainty. Is that one of the fish that you stock or is it a wild fish? Hmm, that's cool. That is cool. Back in the old days, we used to have to do, we would have to put a little piece of coated wire in their nose, um, which was a machine called a coated wire tag. Northwest Marine Technologies made that. And it, it sounds crazy, but it, it's been done for millions of fish for a long time. Or they were immersed in a oxytetracycline dye, which would stain the otoliths. And you had to kill the fish, take the otolith out and you look at it under UV scope. And you could see if that fish was one of your stock fish. But mm -hmm. those were two traditional batch marking mm -hmm. for large scale stockings that now we don't have to worry about. So we, we can, it's easier to stock fish now and evaluate the contribution to a wild fishery and, and have irrefutable proof if it was one of the original generational mm -hmm. fish, too, which awesome. is huge. I got to ask, too, though. So, you're, so those bass, the <clears throat> weights we're seeing right now, and you say you just kind of, you're sitting back and watching, but what, what is, what do you contribute the, the success to or the growth or the, the re this record status of this trophy fishery in, at Lake Anna. Okay, so you look back at Lake Anna, and I already mentioned the, the tremendous uh, hydrilla outbreak there in the early 90s. There was, there was a knee-jerk reaction, and there were way too many grass carp stocked. Um, thousands and thousands of grass carp were stocked. On the hot side, they immediately got through the gravity feed into the cold side and started chowing down on not just hydrilla, Everything. but every, yeah. every scrap of anything green was gone and stayed gone for a long time. So we didn't start to see any grass. I, I, we have some artificial habitat structures in Anna. I used to dive there a lot. I still dive there a little bit, but um, I watched some of that Southern Naiad starting to come back about 10 or 12 years ago. And it just took so long for those grass, they live a long time for them to die out. And then in other, if somebody would see a scrap of hydro somewhere, they'd run out and throw, you know, get some more grass carp illegal, illegal and throw them in there. And um, it was just a problem because there's no habitat, right? And, and so I think that we, we come and, you know, back circle back around to what we were talking about with the, the tidal rivers is it all comes back to habitat. Mm -hmm. If you've got good habitat, you're going to have mm -hmm. um, quality fish populations. And, and, and I think what happened at Anna, and we've seen it, 
Well, there didn't used to be a lot of water willow there either. Mm -hmm. We've seen water willow in a lot of the lakes where I manage. It, it was not there 20 years ago. And almost mm -hmm. every lake now has water willow along the shoreline. And that's a beautiful native emergent plant that has so many valuable functions, both from erosion control and habitat for everything. It keeps mm -hmm. geese from walking up. I mean, it's just... It, Water willow is like the perfect plant. Mm -hmm. uh, some people still don't like it because it's just, they want that clean edge of water to the grass, you know, golf course look. But I mean, I mean those people are kind of idiots. Yes, um, <laughs> you can say that here. It's fine. <laughs> but uh, uh, the water willow. So, so we, we've not only have we seen SAV return at Anna, and still in very limited quantities because we are treating our, our Dominion Power in conjunction with uh, Civic Association LAC are, are treating limited amounts with, with chemicals to try to keep the uproar you know the, mm. the people that really don't like it happy and and limit the grass carp to sort of keep it from exploding again but we do have some sav and we, we have all that emergent and and i think we've seen the downside to nutrient influx at lake anna in the terms of these habs these harmful algal blooms mm -hmm. that have caused vdh to close mm -hmm. the lake to recreational use at times in the summer when that water is the hottest and, and these conditions are most prevalent for creation of habs um which is but directly related to vegetation. It is directly related, inversely related. Yeah. People right. don't really understand that either. So that, that's a key. Yeah. So that is very important. And that's one of the things that we've recently brought out at this HAB task force. And one of the things that Solitude Lake Management just conducted a, a fairly exhaustive review and management um, sort of strategy to moving forward for LAC, the Lake Anna Advisory Committee, on how to deal with these HABs. And one of, one of the easiest things to do is to allow submerged aquatic vegetation to use up some of that phosphorus. Therefore, it's not available to fuel these HAB outbreaks. Right. Um, and so, but, but the HAB outbreaks are symptomatic of nutrient-rich watershed. Mm -hmm. and, and so you've got the nutrients, you've got the habitat, and, mm -hmm. and you're gonna have, and you've got the forage. I mean, mm -hmm. think of the forage for largemouth bass mm -hmm. in Lake Anna. You, you've got three clupeid species. I mean, that's that's almost unheard of. You've got thread, threadfin shad, the only place in my work area where I see threadfin shad because they cold stress. And they would cold stress in Lake Anna if it wasn't thermally enriched, but it is. Uh, and so we've got threadfin shad there, we've got gizzard shad there, which we have almost everywhere. And we've got blueback herring, which is pretty unusual to have self-sustaining herring population. There's only a few lakes I know of, Clater, Smith Mountain, I think Clater maybe, and and uh, Occoquan has, has alewives. So they're eating good. So, and they've got the white, there's, there's like zillions of three inch white perch in there, which we already mentioned snakeheads are eating and largemouth are eating too. Plus they have their, their classic old bluegill. Um, so you've got, you've got a plethora of food options for largemouth at Anna and you've got good habitat and you've got productivity. It's like a daggone gold corral. That was the one thing I wanted to touch buffet. on too. I had a, a kayak tournament there two weekends ago and when you pan the live scope, it's just clouds of bait. And I was, I, was, I was reading a document on the White River system and the nutrients to where they have so much bait in there. Well, I, would, I would render a guess that Lake Anna right now per acre has more forage than Smith or Kerr when it's just the amount of bait there, or at least it seems that way. There's a ton of bait in there why like how the heck is that small lake able to pump out so much forage because that's exactly probably why they're getting fat and happy anna it's yeah like anna, right yeah well it, it's a productive watershed i mean i i go into this with people at times because they get frustrated with say um you know like a, a lungo or smith reservoir in stafford county where it's just the productivity is not there and, and, and i say you have to look at the watershed Mm -hmm. because what's what's in the watershed is going to be reflected of what's in the water and so if you have a productive water think think where's your richest farming you know where your best crops going to grow and if you if you build a reservoir there that's going to be probably productive for fish as well hmm. and like stafford county is not overly productive that's got that red you know clay a lot of pyrite um you got you know just tannin stain low conductivity water um and you don't have a lot of productivity but you go to lake anna you know you border in orange louisa Part of Spotsylvania. I mean, I think that's a more productive area. That is interesting. Okay. Geologically, uh, and, and and then you look at the watershed too, pr predominantly ag historically. So you've got all that organic stuff, which is probably fueling some of the hab issue, but it is also fueling the, the product productive nature of that fishery. And then you've got all these. How many thousands of new homes do you have with septic fields, mm. right, all around Lake Anna? where you know you're going to have some and people with beautiful green lawns and fertilizing their lawns which we we often hear about the detriment of, of that behavior in terms of the bay and, and nuisance algal blooms and the dead zone of the bay but at the same time that nitrogen and phosphorus going into that system is productive and it's fueling the base of the food chain whether you have bad issues with that like the hab is fueling that as well but it's, fe it's fueling this phenomenal train of productivity that's creating these big fish
good stuff. That's that's freaking awesome. Uh, <laughs> well, quick question too, with your experience in in Virginia fisheries all over all these years. So for our listeners and viewers, what are some? Because what we talk about too, and you think of fishing the DMV, uh, there's so much water out there, and we're kind of like there's there's the common places everybody knows about, and they're going to fish. What are some kind? And he does a segment of hidden gems. So what are some Virginia fisheries that maybe pe- people don't know about or don't get fish that you think they should be checking out? And include, throw in that too, like you talk about trout, like throw in a trout, uh, you know, whether it be native or, or stock trout. Right. Okay. Couple, yeah. Two or three different little honey holes, maybe. For largemouth bass, I, I, two years ago now, I got the best sample of my entire career on Occoquan Reservoir. Really? Occoquan Reservoir for years has been a lake with a phenomenal number of big bass, but not huge bass. In other words, it always ranked around the top, if not the top in our work area out of about 25 lakes in the catch rate of bass. And typically I used to rate bass based on a metric called preferred fish, which is 15 inch and over fish. More recently, I've gone to what is called a memorable fish because people are a lot, a lot more of my constituents now really want to catch big bass. Mm. The ones that bass fish want to catch big bass. And so now I look at a metric called memorable fish, which is those fish over 20 inches, which is almost citation size of 21 inches. And for whatever reason, like the people that used to fish Aquaquan regularly, I remember going back decades, they, they would they would come in and they would say, man, I can catch all the two to four pounds, but I can never catch one over five. Mm. And I think, well, if you go out all day and catch all the two to four pound bass you want, I mean, that sounds pretty good, right? Mm. But but some people just want that big fish. Mm. Well, for whatever reason, and we haven't looked at genetics, so I don't know if the genetics has shifted since we last looked. Historically, Aquaquan had a very high, and Burke had very high percentages of northern alleles, and they're northern in the state. Interesting. And they, and, but they never had a lot of over eight pound fish. And I was in the back of my head, I thought it'd be neat to do a genetic thing again to see if if that was holding true. That'd you be know? fascinating. Yeah. Um, we didn't look at that yet, but we may. But for whatever reason, Aquaquan is now producing a lot of memorable fish. Hmm. In, in fact, so many it led the state. Not just my district, but the state. And really? I sent my things into BASS uh, just uh, about a month ago. They, every year they want an update on yeah. your top bass lakes. Occoquan was the number one right? bass lake in Virginia, not only for mm-hmm. numbers, but for mm-hmm. size. And there's two places you can put in there. On the Fairfax side, you can put in at Fountain Ridge, the Fountainhead Regional Park. On the Prince William side, you can put in at Lake Ridge okay. Park. That's like Prince William County Parks and Rec. Either of those two places, it's you. You can have an outboard motor in Occoquan. It has to be below ten horse, um, or you can just launch your John, your bass boat and just keep the gas motor out and use your electric motor. But you don't need to go far. You put in either of those ramps, and, and I think I think people must release their tournament fish right there at the ramps because some of the most phenomenal catches we've ever had are within sight of both those ramps. Wow! Fountainhead, all you have to do is go across the reservoir and fish those coves, and at Lake Ridge, you don't even need to leave the cove. The ramp is in. Uh, for some phenomenal catches. Yeah, so so I, cool. I, I've, if people like to bass fish and they live anywhere close to Aquaquan, I don't even know why you go to the Potomac. I don't know why you go anywhere else. I mean, because that lake is just stoked full of, mm-hmm. of massive largemouth bass. Um, for trout, my favorite place to go, and I don't know that a lot of people know about it. I, I recently published an article about the, 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 the coexistence of brown trout with brook trout and apparently not harming brook trout in the Conway River which is a uh, hmm. river on the Rapidan Wildlife Management Area in Madison County. Hmm. And it's sort of a companion river to the Rapidan River, which is a brook trout only river, and that's also a catch and release only river. But if you like to take a fish home to eat or enjoy catching you know, brown as well as brook trout, fish the Conway River on the Rapidan Wildlife Management Area. There's a great map on our website uh, under the Wildlife Management Area map section. And um, that is really good. Um, trying to think of another uh, little sleeper. Or something off the beaten track. You told us about one um, last year. We went down to. You had a very good. Uh, uh, was it Pelham or Pelham Reservoir in Culpeper? Culpeper, yes. And Pelham, you had, you yeah. Had a it, permit, but it it did, and it's trolling motor only, also. But it. Hmm. There's two lakes in Culpeper County. Both of them are owned by the town of Culpeper for water supply. One of them's called Mountain Run. It's further up in the watershed. It's much smaller, and the larger one is Pe- Lake Pelham. Mm-hmm which there's two accesses on it. One of them is right off of uh, Route 29, uh, south of south of Culpeper, north of Madison. And the other one is in the town of Culpeper, right adjacent to the dam. Uh, either of those are good options, um, but it is a phenomenal lake for largemouth. Not as good as Occoquan, but still phenomenal. It's also got both Occoquan and Pelham have snakeheads. So that's a bonus. Pelham's, well, I want to say Pelham's probably got more snakeheads. 
Both lakes have water willow. They don't have a lot of SAV. So if you're going to go there now and you want to fish for snakes, I'd fish in, in that water willow all the way in the back of that water willow. It's probably, the water's probably too hot now for bass to be close to the outer edge like they were in the spring. But, uh, but yeah, you might want to bass fish a little bit deeper and then come in for try to catch some snakes shallow in that water willow. But yeah, and Pelham's also got a phenomenal channel catfish population. They do naturally sustain in Pelham, I think, because it's real rocky and it's, it's big enough. It has some recruitment. Um, so Pelham, Pelham's, and it doesn't get hammered. Uh, you can still get out there and mm -hmm. not see a whole lot of people. Um, so, so Pelham's definitely a good option. And before we let you go, like two more things. One, what are the top snakehead baits right now that, that, that you'd be throwing? Well, I've just happened to have some baits right here I'm looking at. Um, came into Jake's tackle shop here to load up. Um, I, I like, when I'm fishing for snakeheads, I always tell people, especially bass anglers that don't have never fished for snakeheads before, trying to want to try it for the first time. My two pieces of advice for them. Number one, uh, fish weedless because they're always in the weeds. Number two, fish shallow. I said, just fish like you're fishing for bass, but just fish shallower. Throw your bait onto the bank and drag it out into two inches of water, three inches of water, and that's where you're going to get a lot of your hits. Mm. Um, kayak anglers excel because they can get in the skinny water where bass anglers can't get in bass boats. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, the one exception to that rule is early season. I'm going to use a chatterbait. I like a white chatterbait or pearl colored, whatever you want to call it, light colored chatterbait, and I'm bringing that in. Um, on the flats where there's going to be spatter dock or maybe the spatter docks already started to come up or even on high tide over grass beds. If you can fish it shallow over a hydrilla bed on a real high tide and keep it out of the grass, that's the one bait you can probably fish for snakeheads and not have weedless rig. Um, so that, but to me, the chatterbait's better early season for snakes. And, and you probably want to go with a regular chatterbait, not the jackhammer because I know Brian, our cousin too, is he had one, we were in a bass tournament and it smoked it and you could, we couldn't, we had to cut, we took it on to eat it. But he had to cut it out, and then, of course, it destroyed the. You yeah, know, so you don't don't, don't throw thirty dollars. Yeah. Lures on the <laughs> right. Yeah, they want a good American-made bait, right? <laughs> um, secondly, what I usually do, I like to throw frogs once it warms up. I'll get to them in a minute. But in between the chatterbait kind of phase, and and, and I'm I'm not an expert snakehead angler. There's probably a lot of people out there. Uh, this guy wrote the book. Um, I'll think of his name in a minute. Um, just right, the guy that wrote the book on snakehead angling. Uh, he lives in Maryland. Great guy. He knows way more about snakehead angling than I do. Um, he fishes a pearl zoom like a super fluke. Mm. He, he's got one one bait for finding the fish, and then one, then he dials it up, and he can use a frog once he once he figures it out. But um, he covers a lot of ground with a zoom, a pearl zoom super mm. fluke. Um, but what I like to do between my my chatter baits and between the frogs is I usually use a senko or similar a uh, missile bait, something like mm. that, something rigged weedless not even a weight on it. Um, just wing it up there with about a four out hook and, um, and just twitch it, you know, mm -hmm. through that, that emergent vegetation, mm -hmm. uh, and bring that back out. And, and a lot of times that works very well. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then now it's, we got some good heat wave now. And so we're, we're to the point where I'd start throwing a frog. I usually like black frogs. Um, look, scum frog is actually one I have used. And, um, uh, I like the name. I like the way it, 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 it slops through the water and, um, it catches fish. So I don't honestly, I'm not, I'm not a slave to any particular frog brand. I've used a lot of different ones. I usually just look at the frog. If I like the way it looks, I buy it. <laughs> and uh, they, they, most of them work on snakes. And I want you catch it. Like people don't, a lot of people don't realize some people do mm -hmm. like the, the, it is delicious. So talk a little bit about like kind of finish up here, maybe talking about how would you, how do you, how have you found the best prepare? And where, where you target them usually on the Potomac or the Rappahannock? Yeah. Tar the target them uh, anywhere there's grass. I mean, if you find hydrilla, you're probably gonna find snakeheads. Mm -hmm. You'll, you'll find them in other grass, but they love hydrilla more than anything. And then fish, fish, fish shallow, um, get back where no, you know, nobody is the back of the creeks all the way, you know, skinny, skinny, skinny. Um, right now the hot creeks, I mean, you can still catch them in the core creeks. Pohick can still produce fish, Aquia, um, any of those in Stafford County around crow's nest, even on the main stem Potomac is, is producing fish. Um, you get down towards Colonial Beach, you know, Wacomico, anywhere, you get to almost all of the way to the bay, you know, just find the tributaries that have grass, their fresh water before they get brackish and you'll find snakeheads. Um, the biggest thing is just trying to get away from some of the crowds. Some of the hotter spots now are in the tidal Rappahannock because the colonization curve is, is 10 years you know, earlier than it is on the Potomac. Mm. And so you haven't, you're still in, in some of these cases more of a growth phase mm. rather than a declining phase, although we may have begun to start to see the initial stages of decline in some of the wrap areas. But um, below Port Royal 
any of the Rappahannock tributaries below Port Royal can be very, very good right now uh, if they have any grass in them at all. And, it, and, and the hop yard, main stem Rappahannock, as I already mentioned, could be a good area. Um, so when, when you catch them, if you're going to keep them, you got to kill them. You, you can't be dragging them around live in a, a cooler, mm -hmm. legally anyway. Plenty of people do it, but it's not legal. You, see, you know, the, the law, the, the Virginia, the, we, don't re, we don't consider it possession, the act of catching and unhooking your fish. So you can release it alive. There's no problem with that. Okay. But if you choose to eat it, which we encourage you to do because they're really good and, and you're getting rid of it, which again, I'm not totally sure is needed, but I'm telling people to do it. Um, you, you take, you're taking that fish home. It has to be dead. Uh, and they're not easy to kill. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll admit that. Um, uh, the easiest thing to do is just to probably eviscerate them or, or do the K bar to the, the skull treatment, uh, rip out the gill arches. Um, there's, there's a number of, of, uh, sort of uh, uh, embellishing ways to, to, to dispatch a snakehead, which I won't go into, but they, they do need to be dead if they're going to be in your possession. Uh, and then once you get them home, you fillet them out, and uh, there's no wrong way to cook a snakehead. Any way you'd cook a fish, um, one of the easiest ways, it, my wife and I like it, is, is just put a little olive oil on it, sprinkle small bay on it, and bake it 350, you know, mm. depending on how thick it is for 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, I like to bread them. I like to deep fry them. I like to marinate them and throw them on the grill. There, it's a, the reason chefs like them is because they're very firm. Mm -hmm. and they, when they're done, they're not going to flake like right. a lot of fish. They're, they're kind of rubbery, chewy texture. Mm -hmm. I've compared to pork chops before. Yep. They're Maybe not steak, quite that thick. But, they, yeah, they're, yeah. Um, but yeah, chefs love them because they're so versatile. They're very mild. Mm -hmm. there's, there's not any real oil in the flesh. I've kept them in refrigeration only for two weeks and they're fine. As long as they're good and cold, keep them on mm -hmm. ice. The fillets, um, they last a long time. Um, probably my favorite way to cook them, it takes a little bit of prep work, um, is a, uh, a traditional Korean dish or a Thai dish where you steam the fish, serve it over rice. There's a number of different ways to do this. I was on um, uh, Meat Eater with one of the guys. They hooked me up with the chef and we exchanged. We had very similar recipes. He used coconut milk when I did not and I tried that and I like it. Hmm. Typically when mine were being steamed, I would just hit them with a little bit of soy sauce and sesame oil. Mm -hmm. He would use a little coconut milk in there. Uh, and then I would cover that with shaved scallions and ginger and a little bit of chili God flakes, damn, green man. chili oh, flakes, boy, <laughs> and, uh, and serve that over some rice. And that's phenomenal. Yeah, or black beans. It goes well with black beans, too. Um, so th those, those are some good snakehead recipes. As I mentioned earlier, I think maybe somebody here, I, my wife went years before eating snakeheads. But because she didn't thought she didn't like the way they look, you know, right. so she thought they, they were, were ugly. ugly. They're ugly. They're slimy. And, and, they're not yeah. easy they only, to damn, play. They're, they're slimy tough. as hell. That's for sure. But once she, once all my friends started raving about how good they were, time and time again, she decided, yeah, I better try one of these things. And now she's she's now, the first one to say, you know, when you're putting a fish on, once I get home. And that reminds yeah. me, Steve Chacona said to ask you a question about uh, a <laughs> similar type thing, something about a neighborhood potluck, and there's a story or something about. And I'm sure. He never went into details, mm -hmm. so but I'm sure it had something to do with you being, again, fisheries, wildlife, and and people eating stuff that they're not sure that a lot of people think is probably steak or whatever, and you probably snuck in the deer tenderloin or something. But. Oh, he was that was deer tenderloin. Yeah, well, Steve. So Captain Steve, when I started fishing with him, he he would never let me pay him for gas or for any of his time or anything. You know, he, he'd always be like, No, no, I just enjoy spending time with you. And I'd be like, I always wanted, I felt guilty. I want to repay him somehow. Mm -hmm. One day I, I had some leftover venison tenderloin for lunch. And um, I, I had, I, I, it's kind of, it was kind of like a filet or um, what they call it, uh, London broil. Mm -hmm. Had it, you know, sliced up, very rare and ready to eat. And I'd just be popping them on my mouth in between casts and with cracker or something. And he'd be looking over like, damn, what is that? And I was like, oh, it's less, some leftover venison tenderloin. You want it? And he's like, let me, and Steve's very particular about his foods and drink. Let me tell you that. And he kind of, he looked at it and he kind of sniffed a little bit. Yeah, let me try one. And he was like, oh yeah. He was all, so that was never allowed on his boat again unless I brought, brought, it, yeah. brought his lunch. So, and that's, <laughs> yeah. And, but then I had, to, because he liked it so much, I knew how much he'd appreciate the story about how when we lived at my old house in Vienna, one of my neighbors was having a party and, and, and I, she wanted me to bring down an hors d'oeuvre. And so I brought down some of that with, with toothpicks in them, ready to eat, a little fresh cracked pepper on it. And, um, she had a couple of them in her mouth and a glass of red wine in her hand. And she was raving. And she says, this is the best damn beef I've ever had. And I said, I said, baby, that's not beef. And she stopped chewing and stared at me. Her eyes got as big as quarters. She said, well, me, not me. I said, I said, that's venison. 
She went over, pulled the trash can open, and no. spit it out. Oh my goodness! I kid you not. You can't deny. It. So, I mean, that's uh, Thanksgiving too. I mean, I kid you not. Food. You got your turkey, but he's always bringing great food. He's a good cook too. So. Uh, we're gonna have to have him back on. Oh, absolutely. For, for <laughs> a lot of him yeah. show, a cooking show. But uh, is there anything you you want to plug or anything that's going on in your neck of the woods that you'd like to promote? I think we pretty much hit it. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys asked some great questions, and you know, because that always helps to bring out things mm-hmm. that I meant to talk about. And mm-hmm. you know, my tangent brain goes off one way, and I kind of forget where I was going the other way. I've always uh, said you guys have a great website. Like mm-hmm. I, people come in, where to fish? I said go to the, you know Virginia website because they've got where they've got everything you need and want on that website. Yeah. Um, so use yeah. that as a resource. Well, thank you for that. I'm gonna pass those compliments along mm-hmm. to our staff with the outreach and, and marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, I know they'll be appreciative of it. And I know Thomas, you've talked to, we might, might try to get you and maybe Jason Halleck, we've had him on before, maybe yeah. with a live type of deal where people can call in and ask questions and yeah. go through everybody yeah. at the department. Of yeah. Yeah. And we appreciate that though, because one thing we talk about is just trying yeah. to bridge the gap between, and like you said, your constituents, which I think that's really important. That's something mm-hmm. that, you know, a lot of licensure, light money spent in this industry as a whole. And you guys, I feel like are doing a good job to, to give back or to, to, produce a good yeah. outcome out there in, in our Virginia well, thank waterways. You. So it's, it's always nice. It's a lot of hard work. Compliments you. Mm-hmm. Oh, I remember the name of the, the guy that wrote the book on snakehead fishing, mm-hmm. Joe, Bruce. Okay. Joe Bruce, Joe Bruce, a man with two first names. Yep. <laughs> Joe Bruce. <laughs> well, John, and, and he used to own a tackle shop. Is that right? Really? Yep. Okay. Yep. Good stuff. Shoo. We appreciate yeah. you coming. You had to drive a little ways here from, uh, Rappahannock. Rappahannock. And, uh, but we appreciate you coming over and, and uh, talking with us. So. Yeah. Guys, everything will be linked in the episode description down below. Please also check out the Virginia Department of Fishing Game. They have a great email letter as well, keeping you up to date. For I mean, the, the number, like, was it like a trash fish? Was, not a trash fish was caught. Like the state oh, record. Oh, there was a fall uh, fish. Fall fall fish. Fall, state record yeah. fall fish was Beautiful caught. Beautiful fish. It was, it was yeah. massive. That thing was amazing. But yeah. that's all because of the work they're doing to really bridge the gap of communication between the department and, and the rest of us. So please give that a like. Please also like this video. We're trying to get this one up to 20 likes. Also, for the month of June, everyone that comments is in a raffle to actually win a prize. Again, this is Fishing the DMV. We are the largest, fastest growing fishing show in the D.C. metropolitan area. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked,